Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Salt here, and I'm here once again in collaboration with Chip Theory Games to bring you a gear lock guide. And this time we're going to be talking about the Lab Rats. So the Lab Rats don't play quite like any other gear lock you have encountered before. Uh, they are essentially four gear lock interns who are not fully trained, but together they're quite the formidable force. They're four gear locks that play it for most intents and purposes as one single gear lock. And so we're going to talk about exactly how that happens. If you want to do things along with me, uh, you will, of course, want to have out the Lab Rats stuff. So there are four separate Lab Rats mats. They're going to have four chips. They're going to have your usual set of 16 skill dice with an initiative die and stat dice. Although you'll notice with all these different colors, something special is going on here with these. You also will need their reference sheet, but don't forget they also have these four individual cards, one for each lab rat, and these detail their backup plan information, which we're going to talk about in more detail later in the video. As you can see, the lab rats are considered pretty high difficulty. There are three out of four for co-op and there are four out of four for solo, but we're going to make this doable. I promise. So if you want to look at the basic information I'm about to talk about lab rats, uh, it's on the back of this sheet under critical lab rat details. And as you can see, there are a lot of critical lab rat details, um, but we're going to, we're going to make it work. So I do want to point out that like other gear locks, the lab rats do have innate abilities. It's just, there's four of them and they each have their own. So I'm going to cover that when we get to the backup plan. On top of that, they do have a collective innate plus one. What they have is an innate plus one that allows them to bring in other lab rats. So you're gonna start any game of Too Many Bones with only two of the four lab rats. You do get to choose. I just grabbed Helix and Dribble because it seemed fun, um, but you could do any combination of two. The other two have to sit off to the side until you build up your backup plan, use an eight plus one and bring in another lab rat. So you do this twice in the game in order to have your full party of four lab rats. And then among the lab rats that are currently playing with you, there are some things to note. So there's some things that they share and some things that they do not. Um, they have individual characteristics, but they also work in tandem. And so I'm going to make sure we talk through what's different, what is shared among these lab rats. So things that are not quite the same are going to include their basic stats. So as you can see, Helix here has different health, dexterity, attack, and defense stats than Gerbil does. And actually her, her defense looks a little scary. <laughs> we'll talk about that. And the other thing that's interesting is that not all the lab rats have the same battle stance. So Helix is melee, Gerbil is melee, Slink is melee, but Flan is ranged. So be sure to pay attention to that as you tag them in and out. Uh, because you're going to want to make sure that you're you know, playing them correctly, and they do play just slightly differently from each other. Another thing that they hold separate is their HP. So especially as more lab rats come into play, you're going to need to keep track of all of their HP amounts separately, uh, because those are, in fact, separate. So that's going to use up a lot of health chips. And one thing that uh, Chip Theory has provided to deal with that is there are these nice little three-point health chips that come with the lab rats, and they're used specifically uh, to help you keep track of their health when you're using the regular health chips in battle. So that's what can be a little bit different about the Lab Rats. But what makes them fun to play and also a little bit tricky is that they also share a lot. So the Lab Rats collectively share their stats, their skills, their initiative. So they always keep that same initiative spot even as they're tagging in and out in battle. And we're going to talk about how that works. And they also share loot. So they have the loot limit of one single gear lock, but they have to share it all collectively. They can't all carry their own separate loots. And then, of course, they're all just considered one gear lock for the purposes of battle. So that means that in battle effects are applied to the active lab rat who's on the battle mat. But those effects, such as stat dice, will actually persist if you tag somebody new in. And we're going we're gonna to look at a tag out so you can see how that works. The other thing that's interesting is that there's a bit of a difference between dice for lab rats that you can train and then dice for lab rats that become accessible as more lab rats come into availability. So you can train any of their profession dice, although there is a special way to do it and we are going to talk about it. However, you only have access to stat dice that match the lab rats that are currently in play. So for example, um, in this Helix Gerbil mashup, we have Gerbil stat die right now. We have Helix's stat die right now, but we don't actually have access to Flans or Slanks yet. And we won't get those until we bring them in using our backup plan. 
So what that means, there's only two stats that we're able to adjust right now because we only have two stat dice. <laughs> so for example, we could choose to do health and defense, but we won't get to put any extra points into dexterity or attack off of stat dice until we bring in more lab rats using that backup plan. So like, for example, uh, let's say that we are going to give an extra two health. So Helix now has six health and let's just give it to him. And let's say that we put our other stat into defense and we just have one defense here. So what that's going to mean is that if we tag different lab rats in and out, uh, these dice will also just apply to gerbil. So her current health would be three plus two, which is five. Let's have one of these little three chips to make five. And then when she decided to take a turn in battle, then she would also have one defense off of this die. And I'll show you how the dice transfer in a moment. So stat dice are very limited and you need more lab rats in order to get more stat dice. The other thing that's interesting is that, you know, you expect these to go up higher because you've played previous gear locks. Theoretically, lab rats is maybe not the best starter gear lock, but these don't go any higher than three. So you're also never going to be able to train a stat die beyond that total of three. So it's something to be aware of when you're, when you're playing these. They have kind of different strategic needs from other gear locks. So even though you only have limited access to stat dice, depending on which lab rats are currently available to you, that's not actually true for their professions. You are always able to train a die from any of the lab rats professions. And as you can see, they're matched by color. So Helix has his own profession. Um, Gerbil has her own profession. And then Flan and Slank also have their own professions that are color coded. We also have a couple of consumables and some special dice that are called contraptions. And I'm going to talk you through those as we go. You might've noticed though, that you've got all these dice, but you only have four spots on any individual lab rat gear lock mat. And as disappointing as it is, that actually is a hard limit. You can never have more than four skill dice available to you at any given time. So you're gonna have to make some really tough choices in terms of what you want. I should also note that you can only have one die from each profession available to your lab rats, no doubling up. There are also some important things to know about the color of the profession die and whether that matches with the lab rat that you happen to be playing. But let's start with going through the professions. So for example, let's say that we have in fact trained three of these professions um, and we've done the orange profession, the blue profession, and the purple profession. They have names, but I'm not going to throw that in right now. <laughs> All right, so now that these dice are here, um, there are some other limitations that we need to talk about. So not only are all my skill slots almost full, but um, you can only have one die of any of these profession colors at a time that are trained. So for example, I have one orange die right now. I can't have a second orange die out. I have one blue die out. I can't have a second blue die out. Same thing for purple. So what you do is you have these dice that actually are sort of progressions within the profession. So when I'm ready to train a level up on the orange die, I actually just take this one away. And then I put the level two die with a two in the top left corner in that slot to replace it. So these color matching profession dice you only ever have one of each at a time. You can only have one die of each profession out at a time, and you can only have four skill dice total. But that's not actually a bad thing. What it means is that you're upgrading your professions and you're becoming more proficient in them. The other thing these colors are gonna do for you is that they're gonna tell you which lab rat is proficient in which specific profession. So again, the color matching is really important here. So let's say that uh, I want to roll some dice for Helix and I want to take these two dice. When I roll them, ooh, some bones, I'm doing hot here already. <laughs> uh, basically what will happen is that this die is going to get exhausted after it's used like any normal die from too many bones. However, because this orange one matches Helix, then the orange one after it's been used is going to come back to Helix's skills area for reuse. So Helix can just keep reusing his own die again and again and again, but dice that are other colors because they're matched to other professions and other lab rats will exhaust as normal. There's another catch to that that's also color coded and very important, and that is the concept of malfunctions. So Gearlock's being good with dice of their color is called proficiency on their reference mat. And so you should be paying attention for mention of proficiency. 
but there's also the risk of malfunctions. So thematically what's happening is that the lab rats are not fully trained gear locks. They're still learning. They still don't totally know what to do. Um, and that's okay, but it also means that they're going to mess up sometimes. And that means that some of their die faces have a little red symbol that stands for malfunction. And in fact, here's one right now. If you check in that top right corner of the die, you're going to see a little red partial gear, like a little broken gear. Um, and that is a malfunction symbol. So let's say that we rolled this blue malfunction symbol. What that's going to mean is that you carry out what happens on the die. It's not that the die doesn't get resolved, but once you resolve it, you have to not put the die back in the skills area, but instead it basically gets untrained. It has to go all the way back in the tray to train it again. And that's true no matter what level you're on. So if you have a level three blue die and you get a malfunctioning face, then you have to put it back and start retraining this die from level one. And so that can be something that is a little bit frustrating. It's also something that you have to plan for. And it's something that you can slightly mitigate depending on the color matching between the lab rat you're playing with and the malfunction you roll. So if Helix rolled that blue die with a malfunction, uh, he would have to resolve it. Oh, and by the way, you know, in, in Too Many Bones, a lot of times you can just choose not to accept a die result, return the die to your skill area. Oh, well, nope. If it rolls a malfunction phase, you have to resolve it and you have to resolve the malfunction. Sadly, there is no way out. Except there is one way out. So if Helix rolls a malfunction face on one of his own orange dice, he gets to ignore it because this is the area in which he is proficient. And so that's going to be something that's very key because you get to ignore malfunctions in areas where you're proficient. Those dice don't exhaust. So you're just going to get more mileage out of color matching dice and gear locks. There's no way to set things up so that happens the whole time, but you might want to think about which dice you need the most and how to maximize that throughout the course of play. I also want to talk really quickly about tagging in and out. And then we're going to go to the profession dice and talk through everything bit by bit to get some details filled in here. All right, so let's say this is our mock battle setup. Where we've got Helix fighting these two enemies and he's in the middle of the initiative order. So we have the Orc Rager, then Helix, and then the Troll Youngin in order in battle. If Helix wants to switch to gerbil, there's only a specific point in the round where he can tag out. And then there's also a specific point in the round where gerbil is able to tag in. So I want to make sure that we talk through that and that you know exactly what to do. So let's say it's Helix's turn. We've been beaten up on this orc rager. And now we reach the end of our turn. That is the time when Helix can declare that he wants to tag out. So in order to indicate that you want to do that, you have to flip his chip. So we're going to have a tag out and then you leave him there until the beginning of the next round. So this troll youngin would be able to move and do whatever it's going to do to Helix. And then at the beginning of the next round. So when you switch to round four, that's when Helix comes off. Gerbil comes on to the same space where he was. And like, let's just trade out her HP like that. And then everything that's on Helix's mat and in the exhaust area and the prep area is going to just transfer over to Gerbil. So she's going to now get all of these dice. And she can use them as she wishes until she either gets KO'd or gets tagged out if we had another lab right here. The other thing is that once a lab rat has tagged out of battle, they can't go back in. So we've gone from Helix to Gerbil, but we cannot go from Gerbil to Helix. So we're going to turn Helix like this to show that he has been tagged out. And then, of course, this will all reset after the battle and you can start fresh next time. But for this time, unless you've got some sort of special ability, hint, hint, um, you're not going to be able to tag Helix back in. And now it's up to Gerbil. Uh, other things that are true are, so let's say that Helix had used Gerbil's purple die and it was exhausted. It does not unexhaust just because Gerbil is proficient. Once it's been exhausted, it stays that way. And she's just kind of stuck not having access to her most proficient die. So be aware that that's something that can happen. And the other thing is that if Helix had had, say, a poison die on him or something at the 
time that he tagged out, then that would still transfer to gerbil, even though she just popped in to the battle. So status effects do carry, and she at the beginning of her turn would in fact take some poison damage, take down, and keep going. So they really truly do perform as one when they're tagging in and out, and they share each other's status effects and dice and situation as they move in and out of the battle. There's one slight exception to that, which I do want to talk about. So let's say that we're in battle and Gerbil's the one who's actually in battle and she has been getting beat up really, really bad. And she's only got one health left and she just knows that she's not going to make it to the next turn before she is knocked out. Then what's going to happen is that Gerbil can still tag out so she can declare a tag out. She can still then get KO'd, but she'll lose her status die. She, you know, you lose all those dice when you get knocked out. But because she remembered to tag out before the end of the turn, like a responsible teammate, that would mean that Helix would be able to come in on a melee position of his choosing and start totally fresh for battle. And once again, everything would just transfer from one to the other. And because in this scenario, Gerbil's the one who tagged out, um, then we would rotate her mat to show that she's done for now. And so that is how tagging in and out works. You can't just flip everywhere and keep tagging in and tagging out like crazy, but there are some serious advantages to doing it. And you kind of want to think about where your individual lab rat is at before tagging them out, because you want them to maybe have really done a lot in battle, but you've gotten beat up a little bit. Um, to make it really worth that tag out. And of course you definitely want to tag out if you think somebody's about to get KO'd uh, because that's how you get a little extra life in this battle. Yay for the lab rats. And of course you get more and more extra chances as you add the other two in. So as you keep reaching your innate plus one, do it twice and then you get everyone. And you would be able to add their skill dice to your stats. So that's a very basic overview of, of how these work. Uh, I do also want to point out that during recovery, um, so this is another thing where, the, yeah, they're kind of one gear lock, but their HP is separate, if you recall. So that means that during recovery, you actually can only choose one of the lab rats to fully recover during rest and recovery. So you can heal one lab rat to full HP, and then any other lab rats that were KO'd get one HP. But you can't just heal everybody during rest and recovery. So you also have to kind of balance out who's hurt, who can I help, who needs to heal the most, the most quickly. Um, you know, what is the tactically the smartest thing that I can do? So that's a general overview of lab rats. Now I want to go through their professions and just kind of talk about some of the quirks of those professions. Go back over how they work and then make sure that we're sending you into lab rat battle with confidence. All right, so to make talking about the professions easy, I've rearranged everything so that we have roughly the order that you're gonna see on the Lab Rats reference sheet so you can follow along with me. So we're gonna talk about Slank first, then Gerbil, then their shared contraption. Then we're gonna talk about Flan, Helix, and their shared contraption, then the consumables. So each of these blue dice is associated with Slank, who's also called the Fixer. And these dice are basically just going to have different configurations of the same small subset of results on them. So I'm gonna show you one of the dice and then just talk you through the other two. So let's say that we are gonna train Blade Raider, which is the very first die in Slank's profession. Let's have a close up and see some of the cool skills that'll give us. So as always, we're gonna have a die face that has a bones on it. And there will also be a bones with a malfunction that yes, if you're playing as anybody other than Slank, you will have to resolve. And this die will go back to the tray, boo. But Slank does have some really cool abilities on here, and one of them is called Exhaustion. So what Exhaustion does is you apply it to an adjacent baddie, and you basically put it on the baddie. So for example, I could pop this result onto the Orc Rager, and it would act as a counter that continued to apply the Exhaustion effect to him. So this die, you place it on the baddie, it acts as a counter, so at the start of each round, the baddie that it's on takes one true damage, and then this counter is reduced by one. So in this case with one, it would, the effect would happen one time, and then you reduce this by one. If Slink is the one who is the active lab rat, this will go back to his skill mat. If it's somebody else, then the die will exhaust. The other cool skill on here is Provoke. This one, by the way, as you'll note, has a malfunction symbol on it. Those do tend to happen. 
But provoke allows you to deal the number of damage on the die to a non-adjacent unit. So normally slank is melee, but this allows you to do something to a non-adjacent unit. And then you immediately place that unit's initiative die after yours in the initiative meter. So basically you can use this to do damage to a baddie and then it gets mad and it goes right after you so that it can retaliate. So be careful about when and how you use it. Watch your timing. So for example, if Slank is out here on the mat, we would give him HP, of course, if he's really fighting. Let's say that he decides to do this to this Orc Rager. Um, he would do two damage to the Orc Rager, but the Orc's initiative die would move down below his. And essentially that means that that Orc would get another turn and get to hit him. So watch out about your timing when you use Provoke. So those are all of the faces on this die. There are three Bones faces, one of which has a malfunction. There are two exhaustion faces, and then there is one that has provoke, but it also has a malfunction on it. So if I want to upgrade Bladerator, uh, I'm not going to put another die out here. I'm going to take this die back to the skill tray, and I'm going to put out die number two, which is called Son of Bladerator. So Son of Bladerator is basically all the same stuff as Bladerator, but better. So there are only two bones faces, one of which has a malfunction. There are two exhaustion faces, um, a value one and a value two. So one of the faces can last a bit longer. And then there are also two provoke faces, one that does damage for two and then one that does damage for three, but it has a malfunction on it. So there are still malfunction faces, but generally every face in this die has the potential to be more powerful than Bladerator was. Then if we want to upgrade even more, we would bring this die back. We'd place this die out. And this one is called Bladerator's Revenge. <laughs> and this one actually only has one malfunction face on it, which is great. Um, and it has a bones, two exhaustion faces, and three provoke faces. So basically it does the same things as that first Bladerator die, but your odds of having a really nice result go up. And then let's just review really quick. This is the profession die that's associated with Slank. So he has proficiency. That means that every time he rolls it, it goes back to a skill mat and he can ignore malfunctions. But all the other lab rats are perfectly capable of training and using the blue Slank die. It's just that Slank gets some extra perks. So with that said, let's go ahead and talk about Gerbil and what she can do. And then something that kind of emerges from both of their professions. So Gerbil's profession die is called Electroscalpel, which sounds terrifying and perhaps is. So once again, we are going to have some bones because what would too many bones be without them? You get a bones face that does have a malfunction symbol on it. So if gerbil rolls it, no big deal. But if somebody else does, then this is going back to the tray. You're also going to have two pulse emitter faces on this die. So the pulse emitter just adds the number of damage on the die to a successfully rolled attack die. So gerbil would target and roll attack dice as normal. And then she would roll this die with her attack dice. And then in the resolve phase, she could add this total to one of her attack dice, which is pretty cool. And then our last option, which will malfunction at level one. So be aware is called spatial disruptor. So that lets you place the active lab rat on any available position on the battle mat and select a new target. So you can just teleport somebody across the entire battle mat and they can target a new baddie. So using it at the right moment during roll and resolve is very handy. But note again, this is going to malfunction on level one for sure. So let's say that we've trained this die for gerbil and we are ready to bump it up. Then we're going to turn the electro scalpel into the electro scalpel high voltage. So again, this is basically just a different configuration of the same faces you saw on the base electroscalpel. There's still two bones faces, one of which has a malfunction. There are three pulse emitters, uh, one of which can hurt somebody for two. So you can add two extra damage to an attack die. Uh, and then there are two other faces that have one on them. And then there is again, a spatial disruptor. That one is guaranteed to malfunction again, probably because it is so handy. And then if you want to upgrade one more time, you can go up to Electroscalpel, the final cut, which should strike fear into the heart of any baddie. So again, you're gonna have two bones faces. One of them is a malfunction. You're going to have two faces that are pulse emitters that will do two extra damage on top of an attack die, which is great. And you're going to have two faces that are spatial disruptors and neither of them has a malfunction symbol on it. So as you level up these dice, your odds of malfunctioning go down. And that's super helpful when these dice are being used by lab rats that aren't the ones who are proficient in them. 
And then I want to talk about something that you might have noticed if you are reading along the sheet with me. So let's say that we've been working on Slink and Gerbil's dice. Uh, we've got Electroscalpel, the final cut, which is the level three die for Gerbil. And we've also got Blader Raider's Revenge, which is the level three die for Slink. Either of these dice could be returned to the skills tray and then upgraded into what is called a contraption. So there's a Slink slash Gerbil contraption on here uh, that is called the Electro Raider. So it's a mixture of the Electro Scalpel and the, <laughs> and the Blader Raider. But what's interesting is that in order to get to the contraption, you have to trade in one of your level three dice to the skill mat and kind of essentially upgrade that die into a like level four die that is the contraption. However, the contraption counts as a separate profession. So I could give up one of these dice. Let's say I'm going to do gerbils. We are going to put in the electro blader raider. And I could just pop that in on the mat. This counts as a separate profession that is neither Slank's profession nor gerbils. It is a separate thing. So if I wanted to put another gerbil die in here for some reason, I could. Um, and also, even though this profession can lead to this contraption, it is not considered incompatible to have them both trained and in your skill slots. And in fact, the sides of the Electro Blader Raider essentially do a lot of what is on the Blader Raider and Electro Scalpel dice, but with some upgrades. So let's go ahead and look at those faces. So naturally, this is too many bones and you're going to have some bones, but there's also some very cool stuff going on here. For example, there's a face that shows the exhaustion symbol, but has an infinity on it. So remember, you can apply this to an adjacent baddie and at the start of each round, that baddie takes one true damage and this counter is reduced by one. But with an infinity you don't reduce the counter. That baddie just takes one true damage at the start of every round until it dies. Fantastic. There's also a really good pulse emitter on here. So the highest value you can see on the electro scalpel is two. Uh, but with the electro blader raider, there's a three value pulse emitter, which lets you add three to an attack die, which is very awesome. And then these other faces indicate the ability to execute. So what execute means is that you deal two true damage to an adjacent baddie that is the number of points printed on this die or less. So this could deal two true damage to an adjacent five point baddie or less. If you're in fatigue rounds or if the baddie's already exhausted, which you might do if you had kept the Blader Raider and then you also had the contraption, then you could defeat the baddie instead. So in fatigue rounds or if the baddie's already exhausted, if you roll this die and get the execute result, then you can just defeat that baddie straight up. And for the execute, there are two five point baddie sides. And then there's one for a 20 point baddie. So you can get an excellent roll on here that lets you do a lot to an adjacent 20 point baddie. This can really come in handy. So that is what the Electro Blader Raider, in other words, the Slink Gerbil Contraption, is able to do. So again, we've gone over Slink's three profession dice. And again, you can only have one die from any profession in your skill slots at a time. So you go from one to two to three, and you merely replace that blue die as you upgrade it. The same is true for Gerbil's purple dice. And then there is a separate profession that either of these lines can lead into called a contraption. So you have to give up a level three die from gerbil or slank to upgrade to it, but it contains elements of both of their professions and counts as its own separate profession, which is pretty amazing. So I'm going to put these dice back and we're actually going to follow roughly the same pattern for flan and helix because they also have their own profession dice that can be leveled up. And then they have a contraption that either of their professions can lead to. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about Flan. She has a profession that is based on healing and helping with negative status effects, and it is called Ebonologist. And there are a couple of very handy die faces on it. So let's have a look. Naturally, there are bones faces on here. They are truly unavoidable. There are three of them, uh, one of which has a malfunction symbol. But you also have a couple of other interesting things on here. One is called Force Field, and you can have Force Field with a one, or force field with a two. And this basically acts as a counter. So when you roll this result, you can place the die on flan or on any other active unit. And basically when an effect die would be placed on this unit, then you reduce the counter by one, but ignore that die. So it basically lets you avoid bad dice that would be put on to your unit. And again, it acts as a counter. You also have a lovely result called Regenerator. Um, it will unfortunately be guaranteed to malfunction at this level. But what Regenerator does is let you heal any unit 
or any inactive lab rat for the number of HP printed on the die. So you can either use this die to help people out immediately in battle, or if you recall, I mentioned that during the recovery phase, you can only entirely heal one lab rat. Dice like this help you deal with that. So the regenerator is great for just in battle healing of fellow units or for helping out lab rats who are off board. So that is Flynn's restorator die, which is the very first one in that ebonologist profession. If you want to upgrade it, you replace it with super restorator. And this one has three bones faces, two force field faces, and one face that is a regenerator that does have a malfunction sign on it. If you want to upgrade the super restorator, you can turn it into restorator 64, which only has one bones face, two force field faces, and then three regenerator faces, only one of which has a malfunction. So this one has really, really strong healing powers once you get it up to level three. So that is Flan's Ebonologist profession, which consists of Restorator, Super Restorator, and then Restorator 64. We've also got Helix's profession, which we'll discuss. Um, he is a safety analyst, and the first die in his profession is called Sonic Distorter. And it follows the same pattern as the other ones. It's got some bones faces and then some symbols that are specific to Helix. So let's have a look. Once again, there are three bones faces on here, one of which has a malfunction symbol on it. The next symbol on here is called Reverberator. And this can be placed in your active slot or in an ally's active slot. And then after a baddie attacks you or that ally, then you can deal the number printed on the die damage back to that baddie for each defense die that was removed from this unit's active slots by the attack. So you want to have at least some defense dice in your active slot. And then if you get attacked and you lose them, then you can hit for this number for each defense die that got removed, which is pretty cool. You've also got the Absorber Reader, which is also an active slot die for yourself or an ally. And basically what this one means is that the next time the unit whose active slot it is in loses HP, that unit can, after removing the HP, you do stop to remove the HP, uh, gain this number in defense. So you might have got hurt on this attack, but you've got some defense to help you on the next one. And then note, of course, there is a lovely little malfunction symbol on there. So Sonic Distorter is pretty good, but if we want to upgrade... We can replace that with the number two die in the series, which is Sonic Disorder XP. And this one has two bones faces, one of which has a malfunction. It has two reverberator faces, and it has two absorberator faces, one of which malfunctions. So it's getting a little better. Then you can replace that with Sonic Disorder XP Professional Edition, hoo hoo hoo, uh, which only has one bones face, it has two reverberator faces, and it has three absorberator faces, only one of which malfunctions. So again, a stronger version of the dice that came before in this profession. And then again, just as we discussed with Slank and Gerbil, if you have either a level three die for Helix or for Flan, that level three die can be turned back into the skill dice pool. So let's say that we're just going to put this one back and you can replace it with the flan slash helix contraption, uh, which is called the virtual redistorter boy 2000. Kind of want one for Christmas. So just as with the other contraption, this one is only reachable by getting to the top of either Flans or Helix's profession and then trading that skill die in. However, it is its own profession. It's a separate profession. So it is fine to have it on the mat with dice from Flan, Helix, or if you're really into it, both. Because again, your only limits are spaces on the mats and professions, only one die per profession. So let's have a look at what the Virtual Redistorter Boy 2000 actually does. So once again, there are some bones on here, which is only to be expected. There is a high value absorberator face on here. So again, that's the one that lets you gain defense dice after you are damaged and lose HP. There is a very strong regenerator die, which lets you heal for four HP, either a unit that's actively in battle or a lab rat that is not currently in battle. And also it has some untargetable die faces. And untargetable lets you place an untargetable effect die on any unit. And being untargetable means exactly what you think it means. It means that those baddies are not able to target you for the next turn and it keeps you alive just a little longer. So that is the flan slash helix contraption. And that takes us through their profession lines. Let's go ahead and talk now very quickly about consumables. The lab rats have two consumables. One is called silver adhesivorator and the other one is called Rejuvenator. So let's have a look at each. The Silver Adhesivorator has several faces that have just a bunch of bones on them, which is very handy because we're gonna look at their backup plan shortly, and they are pretty great. 
This die also has a very cool effect called duct tape, which you put into your active slots and it lets you ignore malfunctions and it lasts for an entire battle. So having this consumable, managing to roll this face and then putting it in your active slot basically means you can roll like crazy and not worry about malfunctions for one entire battle. What a relief. So that is Silver Adhesivorator. The Lab Rats also have another consumable die that is called Rejuvenator. And it pretty much does what you think that it does. This face stands for Magnetic Restorative Imaging. And this means that all units and all inactive Lab Rats are healed for this number of HP that is printed on the die, which is going to be two in all these faces. So basically, you can heal everybody for two, both on the battle mats and in the pool of Lab Rats, which I think is really awesome. You've also got a face that stands for Power Nap, which I personally could use. And that means that you can turn a tagged out Lab Rats mat right side up and it can get tagged in again. So I mentioned that each Lab Rat can be in battle only one time. And then once they're tagged out, they're tagged out. This is a way to kind of bend that rule. So that is a very, very handy consumable for the Lab Rats. So now that we've gone through all of the profession dice, it is time to talk about the backup plans. And that means it's time to look at these nice little cards. We're finally going to talk about the innate abilities of each lab rat and what they can do for backup. So I'm going to zoom in on these and we're going to talk about these cards one by one. So first, let's talk about our friend Slank. Slank has a wonderful innate ability called Grease Monkey that lets him ignore malfunctions. So malfunctions can be super damaging uh, because it makes you put dice not only in the exhaust pool, but back in the skill tray where you have to spend another skill point to get them back. Uh, but with the magic of Slank's innate ability, you don't have to do that, and it's great. And then here is his backup plan. So you'll note on a full size gear lock, the innate plus one is gotten with six bones and you have five different backup plan slots on a full size mat. That is not true for the lab rats who only have three backup plan slots. And so it's actually pretty nice because it makes it much faster to get more lab rats into the fray as it were. So for one bone, Slink is able to do something called Minor Repair. That means that he's able to acquire a number one skill die. So if you've lost a skill die because of malfunctions, or if you are just trying to, you know, get a lot of bang for your buck, then this is a really nice thing to be able to do. He's also got Handy, which for two bones lets him immediately set the round counter to the fatigue round. I would be very tactical about how I do this because fatigue round hurts everyone. But if it's going to push you over the top, it's going to push you over the top. And then for three bones, he has the ability to de-escalate. And that means he can place a stun effect on any five point baddie or less. And stun essentially causes a baddie to lose its turn, which is pretty fantastic. Then of course, if we get to four bones, that is innate plus one. And you can spend all four bones to add another lab rat to the party as long as you don't yet have all four. Let's talk about gerbil next. Her innate ability is called Surgical, and she is able to gain one bone each time a baddie is defeated. And she uses attack or defense dice from the supply. One thing that's really cool about this is that, again, you want to get bones really quickly, especially in the early game, because you are trying to expand your pool of available lab rats. So anything that's going to let her get bones faster is very, very good. Her backup plan also has some pretty handy stuff in it. For one bone, she can deal one true damage to an adjacent baddie. For two bones, she can do an incision, which means she can add a bleed effect die to an adjacent baddie, which is great. Those last the entire rest of battle and cause true damage. Heck yes. And then for three bones, she can swipe right, which means she can heal any inactive lab rat to full HP. Then she has to immediately tag out and tag in the healed lab rat. And this is true even if that lab rat has already been tagged out this battle. So this is great because you can heal somebody up entirely. But you have to be careful when you do it because you do have to tag right out and then tag somebody else back in. So be sure that you're timing this in a way that you really want. It is also, however, one of those really cool ways to bend the rules and get somebody who's already been tagged out back in, even if they've already been in battle this time. Next, we have Flan, and her innate is that she's resourceful. So on each of your turns, you can reroll one unused die. So if you would like to avoid a malfunction, then that is a good way to possibly do it. She's also got, for one bone, Big Bolts, which lets her put a Poison 1 effect die on any two baddies. Fantastic. For two bones, she can do a Bat Scan, and that lets her transfer a defense die from any unit to another unit. So there are a lot of uses for defense dice, both for defense and for characters who can use 
it as part of their skill set. So this could be really handy. And then for three bones, she's got Bat Bites, which lets her place Poison 2 effect dice on any two baddies. Absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, an 8 plus 1 will happen at four bones, and she can add in another Lab Rat. And then last but not least, we've got Helix. Helix is great because he is ambidextrous. Uh, that means that his skill dice do not cost dex to roll. That is very convenient. And his backup plan is also great. For one bone, he can improvise. That means that he can spend one bone to gain two. So one of the reasons I like to start my games with Helix is because he gains bones so quickly, it makes it more likely he's going to hit an 8 plus 1 and be able to add more lab rats into the fray. For two bones, he can do an equipment mod. That means he can change the results of any two unused dice rolled this turn to the results of your choice. So you can avoid malfunctions. You can change to faces you really wanted. It's very handy. And then for three bones, uh, you can steal tech and draw a loot. And then once again, as mentioned, the an eight plus one happens at four bones and you can pull in another lab rat if there is one who has not yet been pulled in. So that is basically everything you need to know about the lab rats. We're just going to talk about their beginner build strat very quickly uh, and then we're going to call an end to this lovely video. So uh, the first suggestion is to put your first few stats into HP and defense, which will allow you to stay alive while you get those much needed bones. Once you have a third lab rat, go for dex, and then a fourth, go for attack. And then for skills, they do warn you, don't get too attached to your skills. They will come and go. Start out with Slank's Blade Raider for some offensive abilities or Flan's Restorator for quick healing. Promote these skills quickly to decrease the chance of a malfunction. So those are the lab rats. There are some tough aspects to playing them, but they more than make up for it with their flexibility, their interchangeability, and their very, very interesting skills and cool backup plans. So I hope that after this video, you do not hesitate to try them in your next game of Too Many Bones. You will not regret it. Sometimes it's good to take a chance on an intern. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I will be back soon with some more gear lock guides because this series is not done yet. We have plenty left. So I will see you all soon. And until then, happy gaming.